recover from last night but hey still recovering from last night yeah we'll get ready to recover from tonight because it's about to be wild so it's time for the trophy extra special stout originally black podcast so i want to know what does being originally black mean to you dive into the trophy universe every week with special guest appearances that will leave you feeling inspired motivated and unapologetically black so today we have one of the trophy extra special stout ambassadors in the building with us viola do you want to do the introduction of course we have a legend in the making right mm-hmm. now i mean i mean i've heard <laughs> stories i mean just last night i still heard a story about you uh, i was buying something i mean after after the hangout i went to the shrine and i was buying something and wait, wait how come you went without inviting me well done. <laughs> and then this guy said something about you and i i, I had no idea i was going to talk to you today he said uh, you 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 paid for his school fees like you sponsored him and hey. yeah and the guy just said something random i mean it's people were just singing your praises i don't remember paying any praises. <laughs> so, this one was so humble you know i you mean sure it was it, me yes it was you i mean it's f- so fantastic i mean to have you right here in the studio we have the legend right now Madi Kuti in the building <laughs> In, in, the, in the making, uh, in yeah. the making. <laughs> however you want to put it. Yeah, the humility I mean, coming yes, out. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. What happened last night, Tabeg? No, no, no. It was just a conversation oh, with okay. someone, man. Oh, it was, cool, I cool, mean, cool. it was so, so fantastic to hear that about you, you know. And you're just so modest. Come on, man. <laughs> Viola, if you go to the shrine without me again, you're cancelled from the show. Just saying. The question saying. is, when was the last time you were there? The last time I was there was too long ago. So, Madi, Viola, when are you inviting me again? See, we have invited her. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <That's not true>. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, me for you. But you know what? Actually, Made, I want to know all about what it takes to become a living legend. So tell us about yourself. Tell us, tell us about your childhood and how it reflects in your sense of identity. Oh, man, that's a difficult... The, the, the latter part of the question is easier to answer than the former. First, a living legend is not what I'd consider myself... Because I think there's a certain amount of, uh, there's a quota of experience and actions you have had to have in your life to be able to consider yourself a legend. I've done a lot. I don't think I've done enough route to doing, you know, just as much as my predecessors. But growing up was very conscious. It was knowing a self of, sense of self was more important than anything else you had to be really in tune with the things that you liked the things you disliked be aware of the things you didn't know you know mm-hmm. you have to be aware of your own uh, limitations of, of the things you don't know that you don't know and then being you know appreciative of everything around you growing up in the shrine you know is growing up around a community of people and people are different man there's all kinds of people in the shrine and there's no real class structure Everyone has a different thing going for them at different levels. But when we get there, we're all the same. Yeah. And that's what it was like. You know, it was being a very strong sense of identity, being aware of who you are, what you're doing, and knowing that everybody around you is trying to do the same, man. Mm, that's yeah. interesting. That's very, that's very deep, deep man. Very yeah. deep, man. What, would you, why uh, did you dive into music? I mean, it's a no-brainer, really. But Yeah, you know, again, it's the shrine. The shrine is the, is the pivotal point for a lot of things in my life. I was, my dad used to play Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday every week. And I come back from school because I used to go to school from the shrine. We have a, an apartment upstairs and I used to stay there. So I'd watch him play on Tuesday, watch him play on Thursday. Thursday, he would would play and he'd finish at about 6 a.m. in the morning. So I'd wake up to school and still catch him on stage. He'd play for about eight hours. And then Sunday, he'd play again. So my entire life was musical. The people I spoke to were musicians. Mm -hmm. The people that I went on tour with with my dad were musicians, you know. I followed him to the studio. I saw his recording process. I saw his creative process. There's some songs that he used to run by me before he used to show the band. So I was in it. And I was in it not in an in, in aggressive way. You know, He never felt to impose music on me. It was me that always went to meet him. Oh, my daddy, this one you're playing, I really want to learn how to play it. Are you sure? It's very difficult. I want to learn how to play the sax. So he, he told me, he let me pick up the trumpet at three. I did that for about three years. And like a child, I got bored very quickly. <laughs> I said, well, it's the sax I want to learn now. Sax was about eight years old. 
then was the piano, I dropped the sax, after the piano was the guitar, then the drums. Somewhere along the line, I started practicing about six instruments every day. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> so it's, but that was also to a degree because I was honest with myself. I didn't feel like I had to, you know, dive incredibly deep into one instrument and limit my interest in all the others. And that's what let me record all the instruments in my last album, no? the Grammy-nominated album. Yes, <laughs> of course. You yeah, have yeah. to tag that one. And it wasn't easy. You know, I did the drums myself. I did the bass, guitar, trumpet, sax, keys, percussion, vocals, backing vocals. It was everything. But that was only because of the shrine. Yeah. The and shrine. It, and it's actually quite interesting that, you know, growing up, you had that strong sense of identity. Because yeah. with me, it was the exact opposite. So... Growing up, I was actually bullied a lot. So I grew up in England and, um, you know, I felt like the odd one out. I was in West London, which... Um, the rich area. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was in West London. There weren't that many people who looked like me in my school. So uh -huh. I grew up not feeling um beautiful because the idea of beauty was you know blonde hair blue eyes yeah, etc exactly and the funny thing is when i eventually came to nigeria i came um for secondary school i still felt like the odd person because i didn't have the curves i didn't have the body and i got bullied for that so i experienced a lot of bullying growing up i became very insecure um didn't know who i was didn't understand who i was but I actually had to make a decision to ignore what everyone said, ignore what everyone thought, and just be unapologetically myself. And it wasn't an easy decision to make because... What triggered the decision? Pardon? What triggered that decision? I think it was just being, you know, you know when every single day you second guess yourself mm -hmm. and eventually yeah. you get to a point where you're like, is this what my life is going to be forever? Mm -hmm. Is this really living that either a I'm going to enjoy myself for the you know the rest of the years I have or C I'm going to continue going down this path which isn't really benefiting me mm -hmm. so I had to make that decision and it wasn't an easy decision to make and you don't go from you know from having no confidence to self-confidence overnight it's something yeah. you have to continuously process. exactly building yeah. um, but I got to a point where you know people would call me all sorts of names they would you know um, bully me for my lack of curves but then I started you know teasing myself you know so it got to a point where nobody could say anything that I couldn't say about myself but I didn't care you know yeah. I was like at the end of the day whoever is going to love me is going to love me whoever is going to hate me is going to yeah. hate me yeah. I mean Beyonce has haters so you know who are we <laughs> who am I <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was a journey for me to become unapologetically myself and become, you know, um, confident in who I am. And that's the only way you can be, you know, in a, in by finding yourself and being unapologetically yourself is the only way you can actually be an original mm -hmm. you know, person. Yeah. That's not stereotypically trying to copy anybody else. Exactly. But did you find it hard to sort of stick to your identity? Because, I mean, you come not from at a all. very musical family. My dad family. was very arrogant. <laughs> he's, he's one of those people that has the kind of bottomless pit of pride that when he walks, the way he talks, he's a no-nonsense kind of person. I saw him, and he doesn't go anywhere. You know, he's at the shrine practicing for 12 hours or he's at the house practicing for 12 hours and anybody that comes in his space knows that in, to a degree you're invading his space yeah. so he's going to treat you like a guest where a guest that's going to leave very soon <laughs> and it didn't matter you know what status the person had he treated everybody the same way and it was that confidence he was really confident in himself I, I never even saw that in teachers I never saw it anywhere else even today it's hard to find that someone that can be so that grew up in a in a setting that was very yeah you know there was a lot of pressure mm. and he was the first son of a legend and when yeah. we say legend now we're talking about the legend someone that has gone through borders entirely designed a new genre of music this and that and he was the first son and then he had to decide oh is music for me and then when he did decide yes everybody said your music is rubbish you know, it was it was it was media. It was friends. It was family. Everyone turned him against himself. He had that same decision that you had to make to me, and he decided, "Oh well, I'm going to do myself." 
and no matter what any of you say or do, I'm going to keep up on this path. And he did that. And he did it so, you know, so aggressively that till today, when he's in your presence, you can feel he's in the room because you know he's here because he wants to be here. And there's nothing, there's no trigger that can change his sort of actions or decisions. So when I saw that as a child, and this guy is my role model, it's not a teacher that is going to make me question myself, you know. It's not my classmates. So there were a lot of instances where, like a classmate would say, I'm mad at this guy. You know, if I was famous, do you know what I'll be doing? I'll be doing like, well, you're not. <laughs> I am. And this is what I've experienced. And this is what I'm doing. So I've always had a that, that dilemma of a lot of people being misinterpreting what it means to be a kuti and then imposing those like values on me. And I've always found it very easy to shove them off. So I spent the majority of my childhood was was not self discovery, it was improvement because I already thought I knew who I was. Mm-hmm. I was just focusing on myself and avoiding distractions. Originality has been again, this is not because I'm intelligent enough to know that. It's the experiences I had. So the shrine forced that on me to mm-hmm. say, I'm more guy if you don't decide this now the trauma you'll go through from the questions and and just ideas of all these people that think that they know who you're supposed to be uh, you have to decide and i decided then it was an easy decision yeah but i was gonna ask yeah. I, I, just yeah. going back to your childhood i mean at what point did you realize that there was no one designed like you that would be around the time you know, as a child, I was nothing like this, man. I was proper troublesome. <laughs> I was the kind of child that every adult hated except my dad. Because if I came here, there's nothing you could tell me to tell me to be quiet. I would put on my phone, do you know what I mean? And I'd run around. I'd probably be rock walking under the tables or something. So I think it was around the time somebody tried to scold me for being a child. And my dad scolded the adult for scolding me for uh. being a child. It was then I just decided, man, at this point, I'll do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was, he's one of those people that there's, there's, of course, a limit that a child can be troublesome, but he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't put borders around, like, freedom. If a child wants to go outside and play, and you should, I used to walk out at eight years old, and he wouldn't know where I was. From the really? shrine, I just walked down in the Kajawa getting the <laughs> without <laughs> security or anything, <laughs> just got me people and play ball. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I had, I had that childhood, and then I'd come back at night, I'd watch the show. You know, the shrine was very it was free at one moment. It's all about enlightenment, it's all about history, all about black identity, about being very in tune with who we are. The next moment is just about dancing and music. So it's very, there was that balance that I had. But yeah, you know, I got to at a young age to say, Omo, this is how I'm going to go. I'm mm-hmm. not going to change that. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I think the same question goes to you because you're obviously a trophy ambassador as well. At what point in your life did you realize that, you know, there's no one designed like you? Do you know what? It took me a while. And I think it was in university. Yeah. Uh-huh. So till today, I say that university was some of the best three years of my life because that was when I was in a completely new environment with new people from all over the world. And it was sort of like a fresh start for me. So remember, I entered university still feeling very insecure. And people don't understand how bad it was. But let me just explain to you how... Um, how ugly I thought I was. I remember I had a few friends in the living room in our student accommodation. So before, you know, going out, we would have um, free drinks in our house, drinking trophy beer. (laughs) And even after like a night out, we would still come back to um, the student accommodation and gist and talk. So one night everyone had come back to um, my floor and we were all in the living room, um, talking and gisting. It was late. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to bed. You guys have fun. And as I left, the door, kitchen door was closing. And I overheard someone saying, oh, wow, she's so hot. And I was like, me? Is he, is he referring to me? But I was shocked. You know, that's how insecure I was at that time. But um, 
it was around that period I was like you know what no Simi this is a fresh start you do you do whatever you want to do so in university I was that girl who would go out every single night partying but at the same time I would show up to every single lecture I got a first class in university and I was like you know what there is absolutely nothing I cannot do um, you know in my third year, I had about three jobs. One was even working for my university. And I was like, yes, I'm a hard worker. I'm a social person as well. This is who I am and this is who I'm going to continue to be. So it was, yeah, in university. That was when I was like, yes, this is Simi Dre. Yeah. And I'm unapologetically myself. Yeah. <laughs> working, at u working during university was something, I think. How did yeah. you find that? Um, so I was like a geek you know what i mean yeah. um i didn't have a lot of time because i was working and i had my lectures and i was going out because i wasn't going to sacrifice my social life you know me i like enjoyment yes, everybody knows this. <laughs> <laughs> so um i just found a way to balance everything so i remember my dissertation was due in um i think june the next year and december we were meant to send the teacher our drafts so she could ensure we were um on the right track okay. in december instead of submitting my draft i submitted my entire dissertation to her wow. and um i was the only one who did that so she didn't even have time to go through it properly she was like let me get back to you wow. um but yeah it's all about balancing everything you know what i mean there are there's time for enjoyment there's time for hard work but one doesn't mean you have to sacrifice yeah, the exactly. other. Balance is very important. Balance is key. I think that's how I did it as well. Yeah. yeah fantastic. Yeah. I loved teaching while I was at uni. You I did? Mm. Yeah. I, I can actually see that, you know. But another you thing... You guess what I was teaching though. What were you teaching? Music? Yeah, but what what's in music? Like, what branch of music? Mm. Opera? <laughs> I, that's very close. It was classical oh, really? piano. Though. Really? It was classical I'm piano. I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm like <laughs> But like, how do you feel when people often compare or you know reference your music, your success uh, to that of your father and your grandfather? Well, it's that question of you know, are you living in this person's shadow or mm. is the shoe shoe too big to fill? Um, mm. And I was asked that again about three days ago and the question is always so simple. The people that my love for what I do and the source, my main source of inspiration are the people that people assume are supposed to be the people that give me pressure. But the style of music I play, I source most of my ideas from my father and my grandfather. And they're the ones, their lifestyle, their work ethic, their beliefs, their integrity, the way they live their lives. All of that is what fuels me today. So I can't be inspired by my role models while at the same time feel like it is my... be so... have such a negative mindset of thinking that it is for me to be competitive with the people that have come before me. It's never like that. That's, once you do that, you go back into that mindset of comparison and mm -hmm. losing your true self. So I'm not living in a shadow, you know. I'm inspired by the people that have come before me. And I'm just going my own way, man. But you don't have people <laughs> Wherever saying, it goes. <laughs> but you don't have people saying the only reason you're successful is because of your connections you're, no, you're and that's what you see it's self sense of self mm. it's, it's it's identity you have yeah. to accept it there's nothing anybody can say guy do you know i played every instrument now i need to explain what that means i don't toot my own horn yeah but it's not been done before so when i mentioned it to some people somebody said you know the great prince did it prince played guitar piano drums but he didn't play horns I played the entire horn section, the entire rhythm section, composed all the music myself, and it was eight tracks. It's not been done before. It's, it's not been done before, not on that scale. <laughs> so I know that's a record set. Yeah. If you like say it's because of this or that. <laughs> Nobody, no, you can't. You see, it's not, music is one of those things that you can't pretend to be good at it unless, mm -hmm. unless you're jumping on a mic. But if you sit down on an instrument, you can either play it or not. And if I can play these things, that's, that is my proof of identity. Mm -hmm. That's not for myself, that's for you. That you're questioning what I can do. So if you hear me play the sax and you like it, 
it's not really it's not, I didn't wake up one day and learn how to play the sax it's been years of practice 12 hours a day on some instruments 5 hours on the piano 1 hour on the sax 2 on the trumpet for years and years and years so I know what I've done to be able to do the things that I do mm. to be able to graduate from Trinity a conservatoire which is music that I didn't even grow up with because it was contemporary classical music that I studied and then I came back and I was playing Afrobeat and then I played jazz so all these things are it's acquired knowledge it's not inbred yeah. Afrobeat is something that I, you know it's in my DNA yeah. there's no problem for that one but with classical music jazz these are self-taught and I taught myself a lot of the instruments that I play as well wow so the so that sense of pride is not arrogance. It's just I have to be able to be wise enough to give me affirmations that well oh, I did this thing, so that when somebody questions it, I can just say this is my book. Mm. Yeah, I read it. Are you satisfied? <laughs> Because I actually hate it when people say, oh, you're only successful because of your, your family. Because there are so many people in this world who have all the resources at yeah. their fingertips, yeah. money, name, etc. And they're still not successful. Very Do you know easy. what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like as a parent, even as a parent, I don't have children yet. But eventually I want to have children. And I want to be able to give my children the best that I can offer. But that best is a platform. It's a foundation that every you know good parent wants for their child. Yeah. Likewise, yes, my parents did help, but I still had to put in the work. You know what I mean? I still had to get that first class in school for broadcast journalism and communications. Mm. I still had to go to auditions and ace my auditions. I still had to, like the past week, I you know people around me know i've been working around the clock yeah, waking up at 5 a.m yeah, yeah. yeah waking up at 5 a.m going to bed at 12 midnight then doing the same thing the next day let me tell you a short story about what you just said which is why i said mine is where whereas yours was a lot of self-discovery mine was sort of an assisted discovery somebody came into my dad's office one day and did that he said Maddie, man you're so lucky you don't have anything to worry about in this life you don't have to think about your future. You don't have to think about what you want to do. And I was, I was a child. I was about 14 then. I was thinking, what do you mean I don't have to think about what to do? I have to question if I like music or not. If I do, I have to practice. I have to pick up an instrument. I have to learn the thing that I'm doing. I have to be good at it. I have to study. I'm going to Trinity. This was all in my head. And this was my dad's friend. My dad just changed it for the man. No. <laughs> like, are you, what, who do you think you're talking? Get out of my office. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> he kicked him out of his office. And I was there, you know, that's the the confidence that came from that moment i can never forget it this guy came it's not like he was insulting me mm -hmm. he was just undermining my person and my own reality like what okay i could have i could have asked him what do you know it means to be the son of a famous person or the child of a famous person what sort of toll do you think that takes on a person but i didn't i couldn't ask that to an adult so he supported me then and he did it in the most dramatic way. I think he wanted me to see that he was going to take no nonsense from this person. So it's exactly like you said, if if somebody comes where they question your own ethics and the effort that you have put in the things that you've done, at that point, there's nothing you have to do, man. You exactly. don't have to explain yourself. I don't think so. Yes. Be unapologetic about your own success <laughs> and hard work. Rightly so. Yeah. Uh, what is one thing people often misunderstand about you? I don't know. I think some people... Some people think I'm... I'm very, very serious, I think. I am. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> but, no, but I mean, I'm... In the right moment, you know, in, in the right setting, I'm, I think I'm, I can be an adult child. But then a lot of people think I'm older than I actually am. So when people think I have children already, <laughs> not yet. How do I do? Come soon. But yeah, I think it's, there's the questions that people ask me. Ninety-nine percent of the time, are serious questions. So people don't get to see. <laughs> Like, you've, everything I've been asked today has been yeah. relatively philosophical. It's a question of identity, like yeah. existence. You didn't ask me what I ate this morning. <laughs> what did you, <laughs> you eat know? this morning? I didn't eat this morning. <laughs> 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 you know, so yes, yeah, 
it's it's that it's like you said, man. Balance is so important. We can't be serious all the time. So it's it's play and work. Mm. Same question to you as well, Simi. What is one thing people you know misunderstand about you often? I feel that people often look at me and judge a book by its cover, and I look quite young, blacked and crack, just saying. Mm. Um, and I look very gentle etc and the thing is i can be very very mischievous i can be very crazy not in a bad way but very imaginative or yeah i have a very active imagination and i'm not afraid to take risks um and i do the wildest things just for fun like you know what the question is there then so what's the wildest thing or what's the craziest thing <laughs> the craziest thing oh i don't know i can tell you the craziest thing i've done last week okay don't judge me <laughs> i will <laughs> <laughs> i ate cat food what oh yeah, yeah i think i yeah, said that. yeah yeah <laughs> well, there's, there's how, what what well, how did it taste well, to be honest, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> but basically, it was a challenge. And, you know, because I'm a risk taker and I don't like to say no, I like a challenge, you know. Okay. I think, you know, people have even seen me on my Instagram where they looked at me and they were like, there's no way you can finish a whole can of Trophy Extra yes. Special Stout in one go. And yeah. I was like, let me prove you wrong. You Open the can. It. Did it in mm. one gulp. Um, so, yeah. So when people say, yeah, I dare you to do this thing, I'm like, Okay. Oh, we'll do it. Man. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend cat food. It doesn't taste great. <laughs> <laughs> Try dog food and let us know about that one. I have. Oh, oh my wow. goodness. I said, I said last week. I didn't say two weeks before. <laughs> <laughs> do you know one thing I realized about pets? They always want your food, but they never share their own. Nah, they wouldn't. <laughs> Actually, my cat does share with me. She gives you her food. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. why you gladly eat cat food. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's pretend I didn't say that in case my, my future husband is listening and I've just ruined my chances with him. <laughs> uh, my name, based off uh, your uh, music style, I mean, it's super unique. Uh, how have you been able to define yourself and remain steadfast in growing your audience and fan base? I think for that one, somebody said it on my, on my band group chat yesterday, it's consistency and hard work. We're very... My team is very, very hardworking. We do a lot of like intensive meetings where we question what we're doing. We do a lot of rehearsals. Every Wednesday we rehearse live at the Shrine. We do... The we, movement, right? The movement, yeah. We rehearse live at the Shrine first in the afternoon and then we do live rehearsals in front of an audience. And that's one thing I, my father and I do that I don't think maybe any other musician does where you bring an audience to watch you rehearse. I go there. Bruh, the I pressure do. is real. To <laughs> so oh know that you're goodness. writing a song in front of people and in that moment they're questioning your abilities. Okay, now, what do you do next? <laughs> but I mean, it never yeah. looks like a rehearsal. No, because Pop C is different. <sighs> Pop, that has gotten to the point where rehearsing is just now playing the songs that he has written mm -hmm. where everybody take these parts and then they take it. We're, I am still discovering my sound. That has been in the industry for 50 years now. So I'm still... Every song I write is almost significantly different from the next one. So if you come to one of my rehearsals, which you have not... I will. I've come uh, to one of the rehearsals at you the time. Yeah. This no, that's my dad's no. Okay. My own. Welcome to your interview. On a Wednesday. I will. I will. Uh -huh. Trust then me. Then you see that it's a lot more uh, interactive. There's a lot more of questioning what song is meant to do and all those type of things but yeah it's it's been great so there's been the reception from what i've done because the band is only a year old mm. is unprecedented i didn't expect people to like it as much as they did and every time people come to our concerts they're really hearing our music for the first time and they leave with everybody tends to leave with such a positive impression that it reinforces everything that we're doing as a band so all of us back to the drawing board I go back and I write more music versus someone they like this so let's let's expand on this but then let's try and spice it up with this and that, that, that. you know the dancers there's there's individuality in the band that I try and make sure everybody gets a chance to express themselves and that's what a good band does I think you can they work as a collective but then everybody gets a time to show their own ability as a musician I'm musicians work hard though 
<laughs> but I mean, it probably wouldn't have been easy, you know, bringing the band together. But what are the characteristics that you look out for or attributes you look out for to consider someone an original? The only thing I think I look out for when I was looking out for when I put the band together was integrity. Mm-hmm. If you are a musician that doesn't care enough to work on yourself and be honest with your own capabilities. For example, if th- there's a family of instruments, there's the horns, strings, guitar, percussion. If you're under one of those and you don't expand your knowledge beyond what is sort of l- lower level understandings of that instrument, then what are you doing? You know, I'm not, I'm neither interested in you as a person nor as a musician. Whereas if, you know, you come to me and you say, oh, I've been working on this bass line and then I'm interested in what you're doing and you are interested in what I'm doing. At that moment, that connection exists between two professionals and that's the only thing I'm interested in. If you're working hard on what you're doing, I know that when you come into the band, you will have that, the capabilities to work hard at what we're doing as a collective. As a collective. Naturally. Same question, same question to Simi. I mean, what would you look out for? What are the attributes you look out for to you know? consider someone an original like uh, you've probably seen BLI and say oh, BLI is a fake guy <laughs> you like, get out but what, what, what are the things you look out for um, so a person who doesn't necessarily do something because everyone else is doing it um, a critical thinker and that's something I f- find really important because especially as we live in the era of social media and we're absorbing so much information, there are a lot of people who don't analyze and assess the information, but just take it and go with it because everybody else is doing that. Mm. So I think being original is telling yourself, am I doing this because I want to do it or am I doing it because I feel that I w- this is the way I will fit in? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, because... For example, I I speak out a lot about, you know, body image. We're constantly um, shown images of perfection on Uh social media with, Uh you know, filters, etc. And of course, surgery. And um, I've spoken to a lot of people who say that they don't have a lot of self-esteem. And I tell them that self-esteem comes from you. It doesn't come from the world. The world cannot validate. Yes, exactly. The world cannot validate your feelings. So even though... Um, nowadays we see, you know, women with the perfect Coke bottle figure, the perfect curves. I'm just like, you know what? That's not what I have. But let me just be then, me. Like you said, what's perfect, man? What is exactly. perfect? Exactly. So to me, I'm perfect. And yeah. I just feel like um, when you are happy in yourself, confident about yourself, you don't need validation from the outside world. And exactly. you're just being originally yourself. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely fantastic. You look inwards and that's all it and takes. And that's all it takes. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. all it takes. That's brilliant. So I'm going to put both of you to the test right now. <laughs> I'm just going to ask about Trophy uh, extra, um, trophy Stout. I'm going to ask you to give me five reasons you love Trophy Stout. So you go first, Simi, because obviously you like, you know, downing the alcohol. I do. <laughs> mm. I do. Go on then. All right. So I love it because it is rich. Okay. Let me find out. <laughs> <laughs> It is smooth, it is satisfying, um, and it's the kind of drink you can drink on any occasion. If you're chilling with your friends, you know, watching football, watching a movie, you can literally pick it up and drink it, and it's so easy. It goes down so smoothly. Um, And it's also the kind of drink where you can... Have you tried a Trophy Extra Special Stout Dessert? I've heard about that. See, I'm going to make it. It's going to be on my Instagram very, very, very soon. So it's that beer you can literally pair with anything and you can do so much with. Mm. So yeah, I think I've given more than five reasons. I, mean, I have <laughs> thoughts in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Same question goes to you, buddy. It's, it shares a lot of attributes with, with me. And I can say that you know, I'm extra special. Oof. I'm rich in ideas. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfying. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it's a good drink, man. It's I'm I'm not an I'm not an alcohol drinker, but now trophy is it. So al- trophy is the only alcohol that I drink. So as far as the listeners are concerned, I give the go ahead for trophy. Yes. For now, that is being amazingly extra special. It is 
I think the stouts that my band members have gotten and decided that they're going to live on for the rest of their lives, which is what they were saying two days ago after rehearsal. It's like, man, my dear, this trophy star, everyone understand me. As they cool like this, <laughs> so, okay, they they ranting about trophy for about five good minutes. So yeah, I mean, it's an amazing drink. Mm. Try it. And, and be I, mean, I am trying it yeah and it is fantastic i must say uh, but one of the things that africans have done in recent times to you know make you think or make you optimistic about the future of africans the outcome entirely from the creative industry and that's the only thing i think that's been aggressively pushing forward progressively and it's been doing so with very little support i think everything else comes with the people that work around that creative industry like you you know you you are aware of everything that's going on with music with arts with you know very amazing individuals and you're pushing all that through with everything that you have and that's what i see is an honest push forward everything else i'm afraid is very suspicious <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, same, same question goes for you, Sibi. Yeah. I mean, with Africans, I think we are innovative people and we are hard workers. And that's one thing I love about ourselves, that we're very resilient as well. Um, and there's no one else like us on the continent. And every single day, I mean, if the average Nigerian, for example, can do what he's done with so little. Imagine if he had all the resources at his fingertips. So every single day, I'm like, you know what? Let me not lose hope. Let me not lose, um, let me continue to be optimistic because the minute you lose hope, you lose everything. We ourselves are enough. And it has to start from us. You know, if we want a better future, it has to start from us because we have, you know, everything it takes to be a better nation we have you know the intelligence we have um the skill and like i said the the resilience as well um so yeah i'm just hopeful that very, one day we we'll also have yeah. which is what happens like you said man we are always exceptional when mm. we do things individually it's exactly. the collective that's that is the is the equation we haven't hacked yet and yeah. the answers are there and congratulations on your nomination on um, the Grammys. Thank uh, you. you know, I mean, I, and he I, says that he's not a legend, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> you know I posted it on our page, on our socials. You know where you got the yeah, thing. Thank so you, you know, uh, but through your eyes, what's the future of Nigerian music? It will be, I think. Right now, we have a an, an amazing outburst of interesting artists that are very in tune with the afro beats you know groove that has been it's explored left it's explored right it's really mm -hmm. done a lot of things i think now what will happen over the next i don't think it's five years or seven years i think in the next couple of decades two three we're talking maybe 2040 2030 something there'll be a very significant outburst of instrumentalist musicians i think we, we're going to start to tap back into what we tools that we used to use to express yeah. ourselves properly knowing that our voice is not the only isn't the only uh, means of communication that we can do musically i feel like you'll start seeing the drummers come out and the yeah. basses really stand out i mean all of us we're listening to the cavemen now Mm. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of bands that are coming out. There's, uh, there's Oshagun and the Stallions, there's Marikuti and the Movement. There is, um, there's, I mean, there's the band hits. You know, there's a lot of instrumental musicians. And that's the ability to do those things and the time that it takes to develop that ability. I think people will start to be more aware of it. Because children love instruments. Mm. Mm. I think I, at some point, everybody, all of us wanted to learn something. If we could, I'm sure everybody in this room would want to play a piano. If you could. I, I, yeah, you know <laughs> yes, what I mean? Yeah. I feel like it's a start. That love for musicianship and expressing ourselves will, will start to click back in. 
I'm gonna start listening to more of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And to be, you know, it's a, it's will be the diversity amongst that is really important. It's not just the bassist that plays bass. It's the bassist that plays bass like this. Uh-huh. It's the Hendrix, the Jimi Hendrix, and the Kingsley from the Cavemen. Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 that you know very diverse future where people can really that diversity brings a very nice colorful yeah mm. fantastic yeah, yeah. A colorful outcome man yeah yeah, yeah. So we, yes. I mean, we we play music. I mean, yeah, day in day out, yes. you know, we support these guys. We support everyone. But like, what, through your eyes, what is the future of Nigerian music? You know, I'm super excited about the future of Nigerian music because I think we're already beginning to see it. I think a couple of years ago, like back in the day. Um, our music was heavily influenced by the West. So we would have mm-hmm. artists come out to sing R&B songs, etc. But now we are unapologetically ourselves. So mm-hmm. I, I even remember hearing, um, I can't remember which artist it was, but he was featuring an American artist. And he was like, he cannot match this American artist in his American music. So he has to bring this American artist into Nigeria, into the Nigerian sound. And what we're seeing now is that Nigeria has been looked at in a negative light. The rest of the world looks at us in a negative light. However, our music is helping to bring back that positivity to our country. We're seeing a lot of Western artists, you know, doing DNA testing. Oh, I'm, you know, 20% Nigerian. You need to come back to the motherland. You need to come back to, to the roots. You know what I mean? And there's this sense of pride. And it's not just happening with one artist. It's happening with so many artists where, you know, we're literally putting, um, bringing eyes to Africa. And we are being ourselves. We're expressing our music music and our music is taking so many facets so many styles which is why somebody asked me and said that you know how um at one point reggae music you know was um you know at the top and then people started shifting away from that trend that do i think the same thing is going to happen to afrobeat and i said no because afrobeat isn't just one individual sound afrobeat is you know, a person puts his own life and experience in his music, his or her music. And because of that, different artists sound different. You know, they have different styles and um, different journeys they go on with their music. So I feel like it keeps on evolving. Um, and the future is very, very bright for us. And it's bringing in a lot of money right now. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. And, you know, that, that exposure on the world scale of music being very... The creative industry being the thing that brings positive light to Nigeria, mm. where you know there's a lot of negativity around all of that. That really started from the initial greats, you know, King Sonia Day, Felakuti, and the fact that we, as you know, youngsters, are not naive as to what has allowed us to become what we are. Mm. Afrobeat didn't fall out of thin air, and the industry, the Europe and the States didn't just open because of a couple of hits. Mm-hmm. It was work from a lot of people. So it's really, like you said, it's a collective over so many decades. I mean, being a um, brand ambassador for the, you know, um, indigenously brewed stout, uh, uh, it's, it's a milestone, it's an achievement. I'm not even going to lie. I think I'm the first cutie with an endorsement. But <laughs> Are you not a and legend? I was about to say. But you're not gonna. You're not gonna hear the end See, of this. Let's just keep speaking into reality. <laughs> no, you're gonna get. But I, you know what? That Grammy, you're gonna get it. You know, you know? It's, it's my third project that I've been on. You're gonna get it. Nominated. You know. Yeah. But how do you see yourself tapping into trophies? A stout, no DNA needed, originally black. Say that again, sir. How do you see yourself tapping into trophies? Stout, no DNA needed, originally black. That's easy, you know. I told you how synonymous trophy stout is with me as a person. So you are tapping into it. It's tapping into it. We are tapping into each other. <laughs> <laughs> we are one and the same. <laughs> That's fantastic. What about you, CV? So before I became a brand ambassador for Trophy, I worked on a few of their events. So they brought Jaro into Lagos, um, and I was working at that event. They brought, um, you know, and I remember from that very first event, the 
energy from the trophy family you know the people working behind the scenes i became friends with them immediately and i was just like i love what you know this brand embodies because mm. it's not just what they say um you know in their campaigns and their adverts it's actually what the company embodies themselves and i was like you know what well, one day you know i would love to you know, take my relationship with them further. And the opportunity did come where yeah. I was chosen to be a brand ambassador alongside Tasha, alongside Two Face, and of course, Marie Kuti. Mm -hmm. And it was such an honor for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> such an honor for yeah. me. Top uh, to bottom, they're really amazing people. Exactly, top yeah. to bottom. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that I love about Trophy Extra Special Stouts that yes they have a fantastic product yes it tastes so good yes it, this is something that you know when i talk about i'm speaking the truth you know what i mean mm. i'm not just trying to sell something but i'm actually speaking from my own experiences and my friends say the same thing That's, when they try yeah it. exactly yeah it's what people say exactly and like i said it's not just you know when they put out their campaigns it's not just the campaign it's the truth it's what the company embodies and it's an honor to work with such a company company yeah. Yeah. so what would you say to someone that hasn't tapped into the essence of no dna needed originally black what would you say to them um are you, you need still, dna well, <laughs> I, I, I would ask you know are you still in lockdown because i don't understand why you wouldn't have <laughs> <laughs> no. so yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to hear from you. What would you say to them? I mean, it's originally black, no DNA needed is such a strong couple of terms, man. Are you not originally black? Do you need to be tested? We are, of course, originally who we are. We have asserted ourselves that it takes a sense of strong identity. It takes looking inwards and, you know, being unapologetically who you are. And what I've seen from the team at Trophy is exactly that they have a very strong sense of what they want the directions that they're trying to take and that they took an originally no dna needed musician alongside a legend like tubaba yeah. alongside you know wonderful people like tasha and simi so it's it's a the direction that they're heading in is really what makes me happy to be a part of it i feel like there's there's great movement and that is one thing I feel I've always been worried about in terms of, you know, being associated with anything. I'm I'm always pushing myself forward very hard and I'm very hard on myself. So being part of something that feels that has that same, you know, vision is is, is perfect man. Right. It's been now we go carry that trophy last <laughs> night. I didn't tell you. I didn't tell you and I'm absolutely rooting for you. All of us at the beat are, you know. Um we should wrap things up real soon. And uh it's absolutely, you know, amazing. It's such a delight to talk to you, you know. Finally meet you in person, the legend, even mm. though you don't wanna accept it. But I uh, see me I you know, you, wanna, you wanna put the icing on the cake? I mean, so, you know, as we're wrapping up, we just want to know what is in the future for you. What's happening? I know you're going on tour mm. for seven whole weeks very man, soon. U.S. and Canada. Take me with you. <laughs> I don't think you want to come, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's such a, it's a beautiful experience being on tour. You get to play a different city every day. You're traveling, but about one week in, you're already a zombie, man. You're just waking up and sleeping. And every time you wake up, you're on stage. Every time you sleep, you're traveling somewhere else. So it's the the travel itself is not the pleasant part. It's that it's the interaction with the audience. But it takes a lot. Seven weeks, man. It takes it takes a lot of mental fortitude and physical fortitude because you have to learn to control your body system as well. So yeah, it's it'll be it'll be it'll be wonderful and 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 very stressful. <laughs> it's going to be lovely and we have a we have a couple of s a few singles that we're releasing this year I haven't released anything since the album that was nominated for the Grammys and I've decided this year that I want to release back to back singles that really show more of what I'm doing now which is more experimentation more pushing boundaries with the music more trying new things that I think reflects the values that I you know my music is very much about what I experience mm. yeah
So I've had new experiences. So my music will talk about those new experiences. Yeah. And things that are happening around me. That's what's happening. A tour, some singles, maybe yeah. another tour later in the yeah. year. And a few shows, yeah. Not to blow your own horns, but what makes you extra special? Me? Yeah. Ah, so difficult. <laughs> I think it would be... Again, I never took my... It's because you are asking <laughs> me. <laughs> it's because you are asking me. It's, it's my diversity as a musician. Yeah. It's the fact that I can compose all my music and play all my music. And perform all my music. And play like 20 instruments. No, I can't play 20 instruments. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sylvie? What makes you extra special? I know you're special. But what makes you extra special? So, I challenge you to travel around the world and see if you can find another Simi, Audrey, Adejimo, who is exactly mm. like me. There's only one of me, and that is, you know, my unique superpower. Exactly. So, yeah, that makes me extra special. Even in an alternate universe, you'll be different. Yeah, exactly. sorry, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> so, buddy, uh, what would you say that you are so proud of that you've achieved so far? Three Grammy-nominated projects. Oh. And, and oh, I've toured every, oh, every continent except, it, oh, oh yeah. Every continent? Except the icy one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. You need to take me with you, man. Cut set for us, Jack. Please. <laughs> what, what, what would you say you've achieved that's so, you know, absolutely fantastic? Well, me, so I don't far. have three Grammy nominations, <laughs> just saying. Um, but one of my greatest achievements is becoming a brand ambassador for Trophy Extra Special. Ah, uh, definitely. You guys are making me feel bad right now. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody said to me yes a few days ago, like you said, guy, how do you do it? You are the only kuti I know that has gotten an endorsement of any kind. Forget being even brand ambassador. And I wonder why, you know. I wonder what they saw in me. It's just original. Because you're extra special. And extra special. Yeah. It's rich. Dark, <laughs> satisfied. Rich, dark, and satisfied. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I think we have a bit more time, but I just, I just wanted to just ask like a deeper question. You know, yeah. if you could change anything about the world, what would it be? Me? Yeah. Oh, that's easy. I would, I would change the educational system. It's very catered towards imposing uh, a force reality on children that really want to be liberal in the in the way they view the world and experiment experimental so a child is you know he or she is just living life to be to the fullest at that age i want to do this i want to do that i want to try this and school stops that and academia is very limited i mean how how many of us use what we learned in high school i certainly don't and to waste six years under you know intense pressure very ridiculous rules a academic setting that you don't even practically use is is chaotic the moment we design an educational system that allows individuality that focuses on practical learning morals values history identity all our problems will go away because everybody that is functioning in the society no matter where they are placed will be doing so knowing they're part of a community right. we'll be doing so to the best of our abilities because we'll love what we're doing and then we'll be doing it because we want to better ourselves and our environment we've been designed to be very individual so it's me 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 and it'll never work like that sure. <laughs> How when people think you're serious when you give deep answers you, like that? What did you say? That's what you I said, wanted. That's let what me I wanted. ask you a very yes, deep question. And that's, 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 a, bro, that's a fantastic question. Ask me what games I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> what games are you playing? <laughs> and it's just not, I just got the new Pokemon as a gift. Oh, really? So, yeah. Nice. What would you that. change about the world, Simi, if you could? I think, first of all, I would change Nigeria. I would want us to actually utilize our natural resources in such a way our GDP goes way up. We invest more in our education. Um, we add history to the syllabus as well because um, uh, I think that's one of the problems. Like you mentioned, mm -hmm. we don't teach our history in school. And our history is part of our identity. 
Um, so yeah, I think before changing the world, I would focus on my country, Nigeria, and you know make some changes here, so we could actually become the superpower we potentially could be. We should be. Though. Yeah, we should be. To be honest, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I don't even want to say what I saw in my mind with Nigeria. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I mean, obviously, um, your dad, uh, your grandfather has obviously influenced you as yeah. a person about. I just want to know, like, who are other people that have influenced you oh, as a person? Man. You know, yeah, growing countless. up, countless. I've been, I've been lucky, man. I've had some bad people around me, but I've had so many good people that the it so easily outweighs all my bad experiences. There's my auntie Annie, auntie yeah. Annie Kuti, my mom, of course, my auntie Dakbo in London. I spent seven years in London under her care. And I mean, when you say she's not even, we're not blood related. But when you say someone went out of her way, like entirely to look after you as a motherly figure for seven years, that was her. My piano, my first piano, my piano teacher in London was the person that got me into my conservatoire. He, I started classical piano very late, but my work ethic sort of, really impressed him so he took my lessons really seriously sent me to a few competitions i did not win and i eventually bec i started teaching for him so that's what happened that i was teaching at uni that's i mean there's so many people my dad of course like you said yeah. the shrine i don't know yeah, my yeah. right now my partner uh, uh, yeah <laughs> she is she is so in tune with my life now that our song is our go-to song is "If I Should Lose You," which is now go and listen to the lyrics. Uh, you get what I mean. Oh, and there's so there's sweet. my family. I have Love is sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet. I have my siblings, and they 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 are what makes me keep going. Which is why I told my partner, the children are the only thing that make me have the values for progress that I have. If not for them, I wouldn't really see a future for us. So it's up to us to design to the best of our abilities a world that is easier for them to operate in so that they can continue from there and do the same for the ones that come after them so my siblings my family yeah it's it's i've been around a lot of good people mm. and what i think that you, is Phil? such a beautiful you know question to to end on for me the people who've influenced me of course my family members where would i be without my family and of course my partner my colleagues but and, you know, this has been difficult for me to realize, but I also appreciate the people that bullied me growing up as well, mm. um, because they did help to shape the person I am today. Now I like to act um, and show kindness to people. And I think it's because I know what it feels like when you don't have any kindness directed at you. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate them for making me more empathetic um, so that I could be, you know, a rock for other people in in need so yeah mm. there's other people that have influenced me and cool, cool, i am cool. grateful for yes. congrats to the bullies, <laughs> <laughs> so congrats to the bullies. Yeah, this has been absolutely fun yes man. it has yes. Yeah. oh my goodness man like i'm just i i really have to digest all of this later but you know you would understand later but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been fantastic cool, yes cool. made thank you so much for joining us tonight it's, it's been, been incredible pleasure. It's been my pleasure. We'll see you at the shrine. Wednesday. Oh, yes. yeah. oh no, come for the show now. We we'll have that? a father son show on the fifth of June. Okay. The first time my dad and I will be playing together properly wow. at the shrine. Pra wow. Yeah. Will Amazing. I will not miss so it's that. going down on the fifth of June. But as yeah. we close, we want to know what does being originally black mean to you? Hit us up on Twitter at the Beats nine 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 FM. Yep, yep.